Hey everybody. So we're going to continue with the acid-base chemistry lecture uh, by talking about how we could actually predict acidity constants or pKa values for some chemicals. Uh, and the most famous way to do that is through something called the Hammett correlation. Hammett, of course, is a you know a dead white guy, uh, not Dashiell Hammett, just Hammett. And he came up with a method of predicting pKa values for aromatic structures, okay? So here's an example of a phenol, right? There's the OH group, and it's sitting on this benzene ring. And for phenol structures or other structures similar to that, you could predict the pKa value for that proton uh, by thinking about what the pKa value would be of the unsubstituted compound. So without the, these two nitro groups and without this methyl group, so just the unsubstituted phenol. And then you would subtract off of that what are called Hammett constants, these sigma values. So there's a different Hammett constant for each of these three substituents, the two nitro groups and the methyl group. And you have to multiply them by rho, which is a slope factor. Okay, so um, this this uh, row is has to do with the susceptibility of the backbone. You know how much is the backbone affected by these substituents, and then the Hammett constants turn out to be really useful concepts, and you can end up using Hammett constants to do lots of other things besides just predicting pKa, which is the part of the reason why we introduced that here. So here's an example, and I think I showed this plot before. So here's the pKa of the substance you're interested in divided by the pKa uh, of the unsubstituted compound, so the difference between the two, so pKa H minus pKa. Um, and you can see that they're plotted versus the sum of the Hammett constants. That's the sigma values. So for phenols, when you plot this way, you get a really steep slope of 2.25, because these substituents over here have a big impact on that proton right there. If you take that proton and push it a little further away by pushing a carboxylic acid group on the ring instead of the phenol, then the slope becomes much less. And under the Hammett equation, the slope here is defined to be 1. You have to start somewhere, so this is the definition. This compound is called benzoic acid, and it is used as the reference compound for which the, the slope, rho, is 1. And, of course, we're talking about the loss of this proton right here. So that is still pretty um, significantly affected by substituents on that aromatic ring. You take that proton and you move it now a whole other group away, you put an extra methylene group in here and push that proton even further away from the ring, then the slope becomes even less. It goes down to 0.49 because what's happening here on the ring has much less effect on what happens to that proton so far away. And again, if you push it even further away, again, here's your exchangeable proton, and now you've put two methyl groups in here, so you've pushed it even further away, the slope has gone all the way down to 0.2. So the uh, slope term has to do with how big the effect of these substituents is on the proton that's nearby that's being lost. So here's some examples of Hammett constants. And notice that we have Hammett constants for these, co these substituents when they're in the meta position and also when they're in the para position. Uh, and then sometimes you have these sigma minus, which is where you have direct resonance. You have to use these special uh, sigma minus for the para, um, para position when there's direct resonance. So for example, nitro groups can do a lot of resonance. So in the para position, you use that value. Um, so these should make some sense. We know that methyl groups and alkyl groups push electron density, and so they have negative Hammett constants, right? These are all negative. Um, whereas halogens withdraw electron density, and so they all have positive Hammett constants. So these make some sense. And then we have our slope terms. Here's rho, and for, these are for a bunch of different chemicals. Some of these were on the plot, uh, this one and this one. A couple of these were on that plot that I just showed, but then there's some other compounds listed in this table that were not on that plot, including aniline and pyridine. Okay, so this can be used for those compounds too. These are bases, right? Whereas all these other things are acids, but the Hammett constants can still be used to predict their pKa values. So you have your slope term, and then here's also listed the pKa of the unsubstituted compounds, so unsubstituted phenol has a pKa of 9.9, .9. unsubstituted aniline has a pKa of 4.63, uh, 
and then you can add substituents to these to these rings and figure out what's going to happen to the pKa of that compound based on those substituents. Now you notice that there was something missing in this table, right? This table that I just showed, and what's missing is hammock constants for substituents when they're in the ortho position. And the reason that those are missing is because the ortho positions do some bizarro things. If we go back, remember we talked a little bit about um, intramolecular hydrogen bonding here? Well, that happened because this substituent was in the ortho position. So crazy stuff starts to happen. Steric hindrance, intermolecular hydrogen bonding, strange things start to happen when the substituents are in the ortho position. So we do have some tables uh, of hammock constants for uh, substituents in the ortho position, but notice the hammock constants are different depending on whether you're talking about phenols or anilines. Uh, and if you're dealing with carboxy or, uh, benzoic acids, well, then you're out of luck. That you just don't have hammock constants in this table to do those. You might be able to find them in the literature, but they're not given in the textbook. So due to these proximity and steric effects, um, the influence of those ortho substituents is really tough to quantify, which is why we have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, example problems 8.1 and 8.2 both deal with using this Hammett equation to predict pKa values, so I suggest that you go, go take a look at those videos and those um, example problems, and that will help you understand the Hammett constant approach a lot better. And then there's another, um, uh, again, I said that the Hammett constants can be used for things other than just predicting pKa, and it turns out that they can be used to predict rates of hydrolysis, you know, the reaction of the chemical with water. Uh, and we're going to talk about that pretty soon when we start talking about chapter 13. And then when I was in graduate school, I was trying to predict um, redox potentials, the, the um, delta H, the enthalpy of redox reactions. And it turns out that you can use Hammett constants to do that too. So here's an example. Uh, this is where we used, again, here's the sum of the Hammett constants, and here's the delta H of that uh, electron transfer reaction, that redox reaction, and you can see uh, it depends on which delta H's we use, whether we use those from computational chemistry or from bond contribution methods or experimental values. Uh, but either way, you get pretty strong correlations with the redox potential and the Hammett constants. So Hammett constants can be useful for lots of other things, and that's why I think it's important that you uh, learn what they are and how to use them. There's one other uh, correlation that's sometimes used to predict pKa, and it's called the Taft correlation, you know, after another dead white guy. Um, and that's where the pKa of your compound can be related to the pKa of the quote-unquote unsubstituted compound. Uh, but now we're talking about aliphatic systems, okay? And so instead of just using hydrogen as our unsubstituted compound, we're using the methyl group here. Don't ask me why. Taft just wanted to be different. Um, but the difference, because we are dealing with an aliphatic compound instead of uh, a benzene ring, we have to consider both the electronic effects, the polarity of the, um, the substituent, which is accounted for here. We have something very similar. We have a rho, which is a slope term, and we have a sigma, which is kind of like a Hammett constant. That accounts for the polarity effects. But then we also need some, something to account for steric effects. Okay, so we have delta here, which is the susceptibility of the backbone to steric effects, so it's analogous to the rho term. It's a slope term. And then we have ES, which is the steric substituent constant. And I just introduced this very briefly here, uh, because when we get to chapter 13, we're going to use this Taft correlation to predict uh, reactivity. So I just want you to be familiar with the fact that it does exist. You've got two approaches, Hammett and Taft. Hammett is for aromatic compounds. Taft is for aliphatic compounds. So that's a good place to take a break, um, and then we'll come back later and do some calculations based on partitioning of acids and bases.